yeah. Uh, Connecticut Avenue, and then I hit the Fort Watertown. All right. Um, I'm sorry that we got started a little bit late. One of the things that we were going to talk about later on is obviously moving to a metropolitan area like D.C., and obviously there are traffic issues when you live in an area that big. Um, we are ready to get started now, though. My name is Heather Spielmaker. I'm the new-ish assistant dean for career services. Um, from the first day that I interviewed for this job, what I've been hearing from um, the staff, the faculty, the administration, and the students is that the students are very interested in working in the D.C. market and that our alumni are very well prepared for and very successful in the D.C. market. So I've really tried to make it a priority to bring these two groups together. I'm very grateful that we had such a good turnout. I know it's a Friday late afternoon, so I'm really impressed that you guys are here. You look fantastic. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> um, this really says a lot about both the, the alumni commitment to their alma mater and the students' commitment to your future careers. So I appreciate your being here. What we're going to do is have each one of our panelists talk to you for about 10 or 12 minutes about um, their career path, about the DC market, all of those things. You have some background information about them in your handout. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for your specific questions. And when we're done, we'll adjourn and go out to the lobby. We're going to have wine and fancy appetizers. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Britt, who is our first panelist. Well, good afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, uh, I get to go first because I'm the oldest guy here. So, and, and, I, and I said, Heather, I should have more time because I've got so much more to talk about, so many more experiences. But I, I, <laughs> uh, I've been on the visiting committee for the law school for about a year now, maybe 15 months. I've really enjoyed it. I see some familiar faces. Uh, boy, I, thinking about this, trying to figure out what I wanted to say to you was, uh, was not easy. So I'm going to kind of hit some high points. I want it to be interactive. And, and get through. I've done a bunch of different things, not always by design. Uh, I have so many thoughts about young lawyers, about not getting yourself bogged down too trapped, that there's some perfect immediate solution that's going to be with you forever. Uh, I talked to a lawyer the other day at a networking event and said, yeah, I've re-engineered myself at least three times. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm probably seven. Um, so, um, so I'm going to hit the high points of what I did. And then as it relates to DC, uh, I came in a different way, purely politically. Uh, born and raised in Charleston, dad was a Charleston businessman. I assumed I'd go back and run the business. I got to my first year of college here. I'm undergraduate in law school at West Virginia. I was president of the Dell chapter. <laughs> Dell chapter's gone. So um, I just assumed I'd go back and run the business. I hadn't thought much about it. Dad sold his business when I was a freshman, and he didn't really talk to me much about it. And, and I thought, well, gosh, now what do I do? And so. I thought, well, it was clear to me as far as control of my future that undergraduate wasn't going to be enough control. I mean, everyone was running back and forth to Cincinnati to interview with uh, Proctor Gamble. And so I said, okay, well, I'm not good at math or science, so there goes engineering and medical schools, so maybe law school. So uh, I didn't have any lawyers in the family, and, um, and I loved law school. I got into law school, and it was about government and democracy and fairness and justice. It's like... I loved it. I loved it. But, and, and I just assumed I'd go back to Charleston. I clerked both summers at Jackson Kelly. I talked myself in and out of that first summer and not the knock down grades I taught as a Charleston uh, alumna. So I clerked both summers. And after the second summer, I thought, yeah, well, you know, I really enjoy practicing. And I'm really, after the second summer, felt I had a better grip on it. But I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do about it. I wanted law to be a tool for me and not, and I felt, and I felt this way along my career path that law has a tendency to channel you into kind of some sense of what it's supposed to be. Big firm, stay there, make partner. And if you're not in a big firm, somehow something's wrong. So um, one, I'm gonna just skip through. So instead of going back to Charleston, uh, I said, I wanna live, I wanna live someplace else. I wanna live in a bigger city. One thing led to another, uh, I ended up, bouncing some letters off the West Coast and went out and took my spring break third year and went out and interviewed in Los Angeles and with nothing. And uh, I said, you know what, I can do this. You have to prove to them that you're going to do it. And so I graduated, took my West Virginia law degree, went out and spent the summer in the BAR, BRI, and it, with a 52% pass rate, I passed the California State Bar 
with my West Virginia law degree and taken a summer Barbary. And I had talked to several firms, all of which says, well, if you pass the bar, come back and see us. Um, and I did, and I, and I ended up joining a, a firm of about 15 lawyers that was a split of another firm that I'd seen when they were pre-split. And so I, I started practicing law in downtown LA, and I was put in commercial litigation. And I had a chapter in LA. Putting geographic moves on a career is very difficult and made life very complicated to figure out. And one thing led to another, and I decided I wanted to come back east. And one thing led to another, and I ended up in Pittsburgh with Buchanan Ingersoll. Again, the commercial litigation, that was, my, that was my experience base. So I spent another two, two and a half years in the U.S. Steel Building in Pittsburgh. Great firm, Pittsburgh firm, well-wired in the community. And the other thing going on for me, I always had a Washington interest, but I never understood Washington. And everything's alphabet soup. And the other thing that was happening for me is that I decided I really didn't like litigation. First of all, litigation doesn't move geographically at all. I mean, you've got to know the, the laws, the rules, the judges, the courts, the local rules. Like, so, it, but it didn't fit my nature very well. I mean, commercial disputes, yeah, litigation, I mean, uh, discovery, and it just seemed like a big game to me. I wanted to make deals and make things happen and build things. I didn't want to, like, just fight about things. So about the time I was deciding that... I don't know that this is working for me either. Um, the Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected uh, as president. <clears throat> and I said, okay, this is my administration. If I'm going to Washington, I had worked at Washington enough to understand that what I want to do is come in through the main game in town, not try to talk myself into some big law firm with a litig. I didn't want to litigate, so that's all I had done. What am I going to do? So, and, and I'll make this short. So I went back and uh, I had some California contacts in the, in the Governor Reagan administration. And as I worked at Washington, I said, well, I, I didn't do anything for Reagan. So I didn't have any clout with Reagan other than I knew some people who had been in his gubernatorial administration. So I said, I, if I'm going to do this, I've got to go work a campaign. I got to get my own political credentials. And in that year, John Hines was up in the Senate in in uh, Pennsylvania, of course, well-developed, you know, multi-year senator. And uh, Reagan had swept in two Republican congressmen in West Virginia, Mick Statton in the 3rd District, then 3rd District, and a guy named Cleve Benedict in, uh, in the 2nd District. So I said, okay, I mean, I'm now really kind of out over my skis in terms of career path. I'm trying to make something happen. And, and the one thing I do commend to you is make this is a wonderful career and a wonderful degree and a wonderful capability, and it is very flexible. You need to make it work for you. And I know there's a tendency to think there's, there's only one way to do that, but as when you're as long in the tooth as I am, you'll, you'll know that there's, there's many, many ways to get there. So anyway, I, I made a couple of phone calls, came down to Morgantown, met with the campaign director for what was going to be Benedict for Senate, met with her, became the field director, and worked that entire period. Now my thought was, okay, Cleve probably not going to beat Bob Byrd, but at least I have a Republican credential that, and a campaign credential, so if he wins, if lightning strikes and, and he beats Bob Byrd, I'll follow him to the Senate because I was that senior, and if he doesn't, then I'll just go back and keep working those California contacts, and that's what happened, and I, I then, uh, he, he got hammered, <laughs> and so in early 1983, and while I'm patching together my attempt to now take my political credential and work Washington, um, I spent a, a session, a legislative session in the, in the West Virginia House of Delegates as Republican counsel to the 13 members. Um, so um, one thing led to another, and there commenced nine years of senior Reagan Bush appointments, all executive branch, multi-agency. I was the last general counsel of the Civil Aeronautics Board. You don't even know what that is. Uh, Deputy General Deputy General Counsel for Programs Department of Energy. Uh, Reagan was reelected. I said, okay, this is all, if he doesn't win the reelect, this was a complete waste of time because I had two years left and Reagan won. He won reelection and um, the Secretary of Energy went over and became Secretary of the Interior, took me with him as legislative counsel for the department, followed by a congressional director for the department. And the Interior Department's one of the most active legislative agencies. 25% of all bills are interior related because it's all Western land issues and stuff. So I did that. I got to the end of Reagan II and said, you know what, these are the best jobs. I got entire industries running through my inbox. 
every issue, all the constituency, the lobbyists, the trade association. It just I, I, having practice for five years, I said, this is this is great stuff. Now I'm smart enough to know I'm on a ticking time bomb, and I'm, I'm in a political appointment, and so whenever that game ends, you know, what am I going to do? And so, and I'll get through this initial. I know Heather will cut me off here, but. Um, <laughs> So, I, uh, so we got to the end of Reagan too, and I said, yeah, I still have enough juice left. I still want to try to do something. And I was, it turned out, people said, boy, you're so smart to do that. I, I, I thought, well, I didn't want to do, oil was derigged. I didn't want to do energy. I want to do something completely different. I'm, I'm now starting to think about afterlife. What's the afterlife for a lawyer? And for me, it was like trade or any of the statutory areas like SEC or something. So I said, I got to go back and refresh my credentials. So I went back after the convention and worked the uh, presidential campaign in Bush Quayle. He won, um, and I went into what's the White House Transition Office, which is that period between election and inaugural, handled, since I was doing legislative affairs, congressional, handled four different cabinet secretaries on behalf of the president-elect, and one of which was Jack Kemp, and I followed him into HUD. Jack says, I want you over here with me, and I said, well, I really wanna do trade, and he said, well, <laughs> come over here with me. So. If the secretary wants you to come with him, you come with him. And, and I said, but you've already given the general counsel away to Frank Keating, who became governor of Oklahoma. And he said, yeah, Ed Meese called me the day after the election, and I gave that away. So he said, I want you to be his deputy, but you can do anything in the department you want to do. I said, good, I'll take all the financial stuff. <laughs> so I'm like, how do I get out of here? So um, that was great. The uh, SNL bill passed. Secretary of HUD was put on all this SNL machinery. He put me in charge of one of the SNL bailout agencies. And that ended like all the way through, and I was, tr when, when Bill Clinton was elected, I was counting on coming out with one term of Bush one still in place. And so how things don't happen as you think they're gonna happen, of course, uh, uh, Bush one didn't get reelected. And there commenced now at age 40, 41, into the private sector, with my team no longer in, and me having been in multi-agencies, I didn't have a real, I was not a working lawyer, I was a political lawyer, I was a policy lawyer in multiple areas. So that commenced its own path, and I'll, I'll stop at that, and it, it's all worked for me, and I've turned it into a technology practice, and that's probably its own story. But, um, but Washington, having been inside the fact, and I thought this many times, the fact that I was a lawyer, so with the political credentials, I could get jobs I otherwise had no reason to be able to get other than I had the political credentials and I was a lawyer. And that law degree opened everything for me. It didn't matter it was West Virginia versus Georgetown. It was the fact that you did a good job and people liked you and, people, and you impressed people and they carried you along. So anyway, I'm gonna stop at that. And I didn't mean to get that much detail, actually, but uh, there's much here to understand, but much of it's about life and career development and being good at what you do and believe in what you do, and people will believe in you if you believe in yourselves. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Junior Asari. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, I absolutely second everything that Steve had mentioned, you know, the law, having a law degree opens up a lot for you, especially in Washington, D.C. You pair that with uh, political connections, pol some political work, the sky's the limit if you do a good job and you're a good person and people recommend you and good things happen. So, um, you know, I'm very honored to be here. This is the 20th anniversary of my graduation. So I never thought I was, you know, just, just seems like the other day I was in your shoes and uh, here I am speaking uh, in front of you guys. So it's a big honor. And uh, the university is just, I mean, the law school itself is just amazing. I, this is the first time I've seen all of the new facilities and I'm just so impressed with everything. And uh, Dean Bowman does such a great job. And I thank uh, Dean Spiel Spielmaker for inviting me to come here and talk. So um, I want to give a little bit of background about myself and then uh, talk about my story and what I do and then maybe give a little bit of advice for those of you that might be interested in politics and uh, working in government relations. Uh, and hopefully um, the advice I give is interesting enough that you might want to continue. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm always here to, to talk and I meet with a, a bunch of WVU students that are uh, visiting DC, interested in working on Capitol Hill and then maybe working in government relations in the private sector. So I'm originally from Moundsville, West Virginia. For those of you who know, uh, it's near Wheeling. Uh, I did my undergraduate in, at Vanderbilt and then came back to WVU uh, to, go to, to graduate from law school. 
Um, while I was in college, I did two internships uh, on Capitol Hill over the summer with uh, Senator Rockefeller and Congressman Mollahan, who, who used to represent this area, and had a great time. Actually, my, my best friend from high school ended up getting a job, a permanent job with, Cong with uh, Senator Byrd, and um, he had always kind of put it in my ear, you know, this is if you really enjoy politics, this is what you really need to be doing. This is the center of the political universe here in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> You should try doing, um, you try this before you're married, have kids, have a mortgage, and you have some freedom. So after graduation, I decided I wanted to go down and try something um, and uh, try, it, try it for myself. Uh, I worked on a campaign out in California in a special election where the congressman had passed away and there was a special election for his, uh, for his seat. The guy I worked for lost, but um, I was able to make some connections out there where they started sending me um, um, there was an email job list with the Republican conference that, um, that uh, had a listing of all the different jobs that were going on on Capitol Hill and different ones to apply to. So I applied to a bunch of them. Um, I got a job answering mail for a congressman from Houston. I think I was making $8,000 a year, barely enough to pay rent, barely enough to, to cover my student loans. But working in Cap on Capitol Hill, it's all about trying to get your foot in the door, doing a great job, as Steve mentioned, building up your network, and good things will happen. If, if you're in the right time at the right place, you know, and, and you're doing a good job and putting yourself in the opportunity to succeed, you will do well. So I worked there. My first job was working for a congressman from the Woodlands, Texas, which is north of Houston. Um, I was answering mail, worked my way up to counsel in his office, and um, the, the congressman, or in Texas, we had a mid-decade redistricting in the mid-2000s where, uh, because the state had grown so much uh, population-wise, they added five new congressional seats. A lot of his, well, you hear about these gerrymandered districts. Um, they, the, the Republicans in Texas, they maximized the number of seats that they could have, so they, they made five new ones. One of them was a district that took up a lot of my old congressman's um, district and went all the way from Houston, basically down a corridor of a highway all the way through Austin and picked up the tech sector in Austin. So I started working for this other congressman and um, ended up handling a lot of uh, tech issues for him because uh, a lot of his constituency in the business side was the tech sector. Uh, made a, made a um, it's kind of a specialty for myself, handling his um, high-tech uh, caucus uh, work, and uh, it was bipartisan, so I made a lot of connections there. But what was really great was working with a number of the companies that had facilities in, in, in Austin, such as Dell, Intel, basically anybody in Silicon Valley has a facility that they also have in, in, in Austin. Um, I've also been very lucky in that the two congressmen I worked for are still in Congress and are now both chairmen. So the first congressman I worked for, his name is Kevin Brady, and he is, um, you might see him in some of the, um, the, um, the, the news that's going on with regard to health care, uh, ACA re uh, reform, um, trade. Um, he's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, so that covers tax, trade, health care, social security. Very powerful position. Um, so I'm very lucky that he's still there and doing well. And then uh, the last congressman I worked for, uh, his name is Michael McCall. And uh, he is the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. So when I was there, I worked on a lot of cyber work. Uh, when cyber security uh, was kind of a growing area, a lot of border security work. It was all post 9-11. So very interesting work, very personally satisfying. Um, Around, uh, after about 11 years on the Hill, um, I kind of was looking to like, what's my next move? I don't have any Senate experience. I have all this House experience in the Texas delegation. Do I want to go to the private sector? I think I was ready for something new. So um, having done all that tech work, uh, I had a good connection or a good network of uh, folks downtown that I knew that worked in the tech sector. And one of them was Texas Instruments. So um, you're wondering, Texas Instruments, why does a calculator company need government relations folks? So everybody knows us for our, for our calculators, um, but that's our only consumer product uh, and only 2% of our revenue. The rest of it, 97%, is, um, comes from uh, our sale of semiconductors or computer chips. So we're one of the world's largest computer chip makers. Uh, we sell 100,000 different chips to 100,000 different separate customers, and our biggest customer is Apple. We're making big strides in industrial uh, work, particularly in Internet of Things, if you've heard of that, uh, connectivity, um, and then in automotive technology. So it's been great working there. I handle all of those issues. Um, big things that we're handling now uh, that we're working on, of course, is, 
tax reform. Uh, we feel like there's a once in a lifetime opportunity for Congress to take up tax. The last time was 1986. Uh, trade, um, some of you have been watching um, some of the negotiations uh, with regard to NAFTA 2.0. So we're working on that, very big for us. Uh, we, we export close to 90% of all the chips that we make. Um, so uh, international trade and access to markets is very big. Um, another big issue that I handle is immigration. So um, TI hi hires primarily electrical engineers. Um, at the bachelor's level, we hire um, just basically um, US born engineers because there's enough at the EE level graduating from our US universities. But when you look at the masters and PhDs that are graduating, they're almost all from India or China, unfortunately. So, we want to be able to hire those folks that are graduating from our U.S. universities to keep us internationally competitive, but then we also invest in STEM education um, to kind of grow our own set of researchers. So um, I've been real happy to work with Dean Salento, with the, the, uh, the Dean of Engineering here. He does a great job, and the School of Engineering is really kind of growing by leaps and bounds, and hopefully we'll get to the Tier 1 Research University designation soon, but they compete in, for federal grants and, and do a great job. Um, so. That's a little bit about me. Um, I would say that um, I, I want to reiterate what Steve had mentioned. You know, just getting your foot in the door, doing such a great, doing a great job with what you're given. Always being willing to take extra responsibility, even if it doesn't come with a title, just so you can have that experience. Um, and then networking. Um, I would say if you're interested in working on Capitol Hill, the best, uh, the the number one place you should start looking is with your home delegation, particularly with the West Virginia delegation. If you're, if you're from West Virginia, if you've gone, obviously you're going to, to school here, or you know if um, if you're from another state, where somewhere where you have a, a nexus where they have a reason to hire you, um, uh, I would also say that uh, it's important to move to D.C. or at least have a D.C. address on your resume because that way they'll realize that you're serious. We get when I when I hired for the congressman, we would receive hundreds and hundreds of applications for one job you know, lower level job that, you know, entry level that, you know, because it's so, they're so, it's so competitive um, to try to get in on Capitol Hill. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, if you can um, do, do an internship or try to get a permanent position, if you can't get a permanent position, do an internship because you learn the skills and you're able to hit the ground running and you network while you're there. So um, you meet all kinds of people. And then, um, I would say that uh, it's important to have long-term goals. So um, figuring out like a rough estimate or a rough idea of where you want to be. I always knew I wanted to go into the tech sector after working for the congressman from Austin. And you kind of want to take jobs that have a narrative towards the goal. Like um, I have friends that, um, you know, they worked in, they, they, they've lobbied for ag groups, they've lobbied for trucking, for transportation, and there's, there's it's kind of like, Hodgepodge. Uh, you want it really says something if you've got a resume and experience that kind of build towards a goal. So um, happy to talk to anybody that uh, is interested. Um, again, I meet with member or with uh, WV alumni all the time and new graduates uh, about jobs on Capitol Hill, and ha uh, happy to help out in any way. So thanks, thanks for having me. I am Chris Williamson. Um, first, let me say I got a cold a couple days ago, so I apologize if I sound a little raspy or you guys can't hear me. But so I think probably the the most helpful thing that I can do is kind of tell you a little bit about my background um, and sort of what I've been able to do in D.C. I graduated in 2010 and went straight to D.C. from um, the WVU College of Law, and I've been there for the past seven years. And I think I'm on my let me see one two. I think I'm on my fifth job in seven years. So I've bounced around a bit and gotten a very rich experience in a short period of time. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of give you my background, tell you sort of like what I've been, what I've done the last seven years, how I was able to sort of open those doors and get to those things. Uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now. I'm currently in a career government position at the National Labor Relations Board where I'm a senior counsel to one of the five board members. And then, you know, I think like, uh, like these guys, I'll probably just give you a couple like tips that I think might be helpful as you think about Washington DC and, you know, trying to find jobs there, whether that's on Capitol Hill or, um, you know, with the government or, or what have you. So, uh, so basically my background is, is I am originally from Southern West Virginia. I'm from Mingo County. 
and I'm a first generation college student. And I went to school here at WVU. I did political science and economics. Um, was very I was involved in student government. Um, you know, worked. Uh, my favorite class was, uh, for those of you that took it, that were WVU undergrads, was with Dr. DeClerico and uh, Dr. Hammock. I don't know if you guys, if they were still around when you guys were here, but it was a wonderful class and kind of gave me a love of, of, of politics and government and you know, so I did some different things. I did an internship at the West Virginia Legislature when I was here in undergrad. Uh, I actually even ran, this was back in West Virginia, back when like you ran as a uh, delegate to the National Convention. I did that one year just out of the blue for fun, which was a pretty good experience. So I, I got a very, um, I was very interested and engaged in politics when I was here as an undergrad. It was uh, 2001 to 2005, so it was in the middle of the Iraq War and so there was just a lot going on on campus. Um, you know, it was a good time to be a student, to be engaged on those things. And so came time around, around my senior year, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. So I'm interested in, in law, I'm interested in government, I'm interested in politics, I'm interested in public service, all those things. And I ended up applying for graduate schools and law school at the same time. And at that point in time, I thought I, I thought I wanted to stay in West Virginia. I knew I wanted to go to law school here. And, but, you know, I was also still interested in government and politics, and I ended up applying to and getting in uh, American University's uh, Master in Public Policy program. And luckily, I got a two-year deferral from the law school here to go out to Washington, D.C. and to have that experience and then come back here to law school. So while I was out there, I had a great master's program. Uh, American was a great school. I got to... Uh, sort of focus on like how to analyze public policy is a lot of economics, a lot of um, just different like market analysis type things. And I also got to do a concentration in politics and like campaigns, which was really interesting too. So I get a very broad experience. So while I was there, I couldn't do this when I was an undergrad just because I just didn't have the money and I didn't know how to do it, how to do like an internship on Capitol Hill. But while I was in grad school at American, since I already had the sunk cost of having to like rent a very expensive apartment out there, I hit up the entire congressional West Virginia congressional delegation. So I first did a internship with Senator Rockefeller uh, during the school year, and then I did an internship with uh, Congressman Ray Hall, who was my congressman at the time. And then uh, my last semester, I did a internship in Senator Byrd's office. So kind of went around the, the whole delegation there and had a great experience. So then I came back here to law school and had a wonderful experience. I was very involved in a lot of student organizations, especially uh, some of the progressive ones. So I was president of the Democratic Law Caucus. Uh, I was vice president of the American Constitution Society. I, we had a labor law society that I was involved in. So I didn't really know, like I came to law school and I knew that I wanted, I, I had all this interest. I'd always been interested in like economic justice issues, those types of things coming from Southern West Virginia. And I took Professor LaFaso's labor law course my first semester and second, or yeah, first semester, second year. And first day just like loved it. Um, Cause it was, and what I found was it was a way for me to sort of, it was a way for me to like practice in an area or be, have, be interested in an area of the law that deals with like socioeconomic issues, like justice issues. And labor law is very rich in policy too. So I just come out of policy school and had this background in public policy and I found the policy issues to be like fascinating. So basically I took every labor law course I could here at this law school and sort of developed a specialization in labor law. And fortunately enough, Professor LaFaso is here teaches a number of classes. Professor Bastris teaches, um, teaches like the Title VII class, um, employment discrimination. So there's just a lot of offerings here. And then I found out about this program called the Peggy Browning Fund. And I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship there my second year. My first year I did a, um, when I was in law school, I did a PIA fellowship in Logan at Legal Aid of West Virginia, which I kind of got to go back home and that was a great experience. But my second summer, I went to DC and I worked at the National Labor Relations Board. So it was a great experience because I got to do public service, I got to do labor law, 
and I got to go to walk back to Washington DC and I had a great experience there. So I went into my third year and I was like, that's what I want to, you know, I want to, I applied to honors programs at uh, Department of Labor. I applied to honors programs at the National Labor Relations Board where I'd work. Uh, I think I even applied to the EOC. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go be a government attorney and uh, probably do litigation because I did moot court and ogre <coughs> when I was here in law school. And right when I was graduating was a time when the market was sort of tanking and you know, everybody that had these firm offers were getting them yanked and you sort of had this ripple effect where those people that were now sort of filtering down into the government jobs and the honors attorney jobs, which are already really competitive, became even more so. And I remember I got a phone call because um, I, I really wanted to be an honors attorney at the NLRB. I got a phone call from one of the people that were on the board that I worked with that summer and she basically was like, yeah, like this pool is, you know, it's, it's super competitive. There are people here that already done like federal appellate clerkships. You know, you're really competitive. We'd love to have you, but you know, you made it to like the cut of 12 out of 600 and some people. So, so now I had to sort of scramble and figure out what I was going to do after that. Fortunately enough, I was able to get a job at the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission, which is a small federal agency in DC, where I basically was a law clerk to a federal administrative law judge there. And it was an interesting time to be at the agency because it was right after uh, Upper Big Branch, the big mine disaster that killed 29 miners in Southern West Virginia happened right after, or right my last semester of law school. So it was an interesting time to be at the agency. There was a big, huge backlog of cases. A lot of like young attorneys were brought into law clerks to help get rid of that backlog. Had a great experience there. While I thought I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to do traditional labor law, this was sort of inter it was sort of related because there's a lot there were a lot of like whistleblower things under the Mine Act and a lot of similarities. But you know, being from southern West Virginia growing up there, it was also really interesting for me to develop a specialty in mine safety and health law too, that kind of I could combine with you know my labor law background. So then I decided I had done all these Hill, Hill internships. There was still a part of me that wanted to work on Capitol Hill. And I decided after having this like, great experience working for this judge that basically if I was going to pull the trigger on that, I needed to do it. So I reached out. Senator Manchin had been um, in the Senate not too long. And I had a friend that from undergrad that worked in his office that came with him from when he was governor in West Virginia. So I reached out to her and said, hey, you know, if you, she was one of the a, a number of people that I still knew that worked on the Hill that I'd reached out to. And she, I said, you know, if you hear of anything, you know, I'm interested in, you know, trying to work on the Hill, et cetera. Just turned out that Senator Manchin had just lost his like labor and mine safety person and needed a labor and mine safety staffer. So I took a job in his office. I took a pay cut. I wasn't exactly making a ton of money um, and, as a GS-11 at the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission, but I took a pay cut to get my foot in the door on Capitol Hill. I worked in Senator Manchin's office for about a year and a half. I did labor, mine safety, and health. I was his agriculture LA. I did two farm bills. I didn't know anything about agricultural issues or um, agricultural law or any of that before being in his office. I did a ton of energy work. I'll admit this now. I didn't take energy law in law school. I didn't take environmental law in law school. And you guys have, I mean, we had those classes when I was here, but you have an even more robust program in that area now. I hadn't take any of those, but you know, you learn, that's the great thing about being a lawyer. Like you learn how to pick up issues on the fly and that's really important on the Hill because you have to be, you have to cover so much ground. So I did that for about a year and a half and then an, an opening came up to be labor council on the Senate health committee. And that's like a really like prestigious job being able to work as like a committee council. So I knew some people cause I was very involved in the labor issues and made some contacts on the committee and knew some of the people and the job did traditional labor law, it did mine safety and health. Everything that I was interested in working on was in this one little portfolio. And I got to work for someone who was like, you know, as far as he'll, I mean, everybody would probably say this about their bosses, but Senator Harkin was a wonderful boss. I had just like a wonderful experience. But when I took that job, I knew he, I knew he was retiring. So I had, I knew I had about a year, year and a half to figure out what my next step was going to be. So as sad as I was that that experience had an expiration date, I was fortunate enough to use my contacts while I was there to um, 
get a political appointee ship at the end of the Obama administration, at the Mine Safety and Health Administration, at the Department of Labor. So I was there for about a year, had a great experience there. And then um, I think as Steve was saying, those jobs run out. They, you turn into a pumpkin at the end of the administration. So I was I had to think of what I was going to do next. So I got a, got this job that I have now at the NLRB where it's kind of like a law clerk job, but it's a little different. And it's a career job. It's more stable. Um, you know, happy to talk to anybody about what it's like as a government attorney, having a little bit more like work-life balance, those types of things afterwards. And, you know, just to, just to sum up, I give you a couple quick tips. Like I said, I went, if you had the opportunity to go out to DC while you're here in law school, whether it's work for an agency, whatever it is, do that. It's a great experience. You get to meet people at that agency. So much in, in like, you know, there's this USA jobs platform that everybody applies for jobs. And it's just this like thing, abstract thing that's out there that you put, send a resume to and who knows if you'll ever hear anything back from. So there, I, I can't overstress how much, how important it is to actually go meet people in DC, you know, have them like see your face, like meet them. Because that's how most people get jobs in Washington is networking. It's, it's, it's super important. So if you have the opportunity to do that, do that. You know, I created a specialization for myself here in labor law, and I was able to market myself as, as that in D.C. Um, even though I didn't come from, like, you know, the top 10 law school, I had this robust labor background that a lot of those students didn't have. So that helped me a lot, too, in terms of marketing myself. Um, the, other, the, the last thing I'll tell you is, is that um, so much in Washington, D.C., especially in Capitol Hill, like, there's certainly a luck element to all these jobs. And I bounced around within, like, five or so, like, I guess seven years and just kept bouncing to one opportunity to the next. And there was a luck element. But what I always tell people that I meet with is, is that you have to make sure that you're prepared to capitalize when one of those opportunities comes up. So that's really all you can do is just make sure that you're prepared to capitalize when you hear about a job or somebody tells you about a job that you're got your resume ready you're, you know, you got your contacts ready to go so I'll, I'll stop there I probably talked enough so Thank you. well first of all um, I'm very happy to be here my name is Chip Slavin I graduated from the law school in 2007 and, in, and from WVU as an undergrad much earlier than that in the 90s had a little bit of uh, period of time between law school and undergraduate work but I have to if Chris was on a stand right now and I have to Opposing him, I would have to say, like, isn't it true your voice is really upset because of the Nationals game last night? Uh, Chris is a big, big Nats fan, as I am. So we're sad today. I may or may not have been there and <laughs> got, gotten home and and I may not, at, like, 2 o'clock. Suspected to that. Robbed. Yeah, it was awful. Anyway, um, Chris is a great guy. This, this whole panel, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here. I have many similar listening to everyone else's story. I knew Chris is a little bit already. He and I know each other in Washington. Um, particularly with Steve, but I, 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 listening to you, I, I, you were kind of mirror images of each other in many ways. A couple differences, but um, I, I'm a resident originally of Grafton, West Virginia. My mother still lives there. My brother and his wife live here in Morgantown, so I'm here a lot. Um, as I said, I went to WVU as an undergrad, um, had a, went in with, to, to undergrad with the intention of someday becoming a lawyer and being interested in politics. And uh, that never really changed, although I took a, a, a long path uh, sort of to get where I wanted to go, but was uh, very active on campus and loved Dr. DeClerica's classes and, and some of my history classes, um, but also jumped in with things like, uh, was also president of my fraternity, five sigs though, uh, a couple houses up, and uh, did student government as well, which I really enjoyed. Um, and so I had a real interest in, in government and law and wasn't sure what I was going to do, but what really, I think the theme you've heard so far is the importance of networking and working your contacts. You need, you absolutely need the skills. You can't, you know, you, you, you've got to have something behind it, but building a list of contacts, people who know what you can do is just incredibly invaluable. And for me, probably the biggest thing I ever did is one of my, um, after my junior year, I believe it was, I, where I really wanted to go to Washington and become an intern. And I, I thought about, I, it hit me that I wanted to do that a little late. And so I started calling this, our senators, uh, the, everything was full. My congressman was Alan Mollihan. His internship was full. So I went down the list of the other West Virginia congressmen, and a guy named Bob Wise, who actually uh, took over from McStaten, who was referenced earlier, was a congressman from Charleston. And I didn't know a lot about him, except I heard he was a good congressman. And I called the office, 
and said, is there any chance you guys, you know, might have an, an, an internship open? And they said, actually, we just decided to add one. Um, and this was May. So, I mean, this, I've already taken finals. Um, and they said, but does it pay? It's volunteer, but if you want to come in and talk about it, that's great. And for me, I was fortunate. I had a relative, a great aunt, who was almost like my third grandmother, who lived on Connecticut Avenue, um, right by the zoo. And I knew I could go there for the summer and stay with her. So I went and interviewed, um, got offered the position, started five days later. And it ended up being an incredible experience. Um, I learned all kinds of things, and I left that job thinking, like, this is definitely something I want to do. Um, but what I really benefited from was the, the interaction with, with, with Bob Wise and with his staff. Because two years later, he was looking for uh, a, a congressional or a campaign worker to go move to the Eastern Panhandle after West Virginia went from four members of Congress to three. And he ran into a friend of mine who was an undergrad with me who had taken a job with, uh, with Governor Caperton at the time as a personal aide. And we'd, I'd introduced them at an event once when, got, when the congressman was in Morgantown. And uh, they started talking about this campaign, and he said, hey, Chip doesn't know what he's going to do. Uh, he's getting ready to, to, to finish up in Morgantown. You should give him a call. And uh, that led to my 12-year career in politics. I started working for him. I, I, I moved to the Eastern Panhandle, which I, even though I was from West Virginia, had not spent much time there. Moved to Martinsburg. Lived my office and my apartment were one and the same for a year. He would come over. I take him around. We do events. I, I mingled with the local Democratic Party and with local officials. And then after he won uh, re-election and he had this new area, he had promised to open an office there. So he hired me to be the first employee. And uh, that office eventually grew to a, a full-time staff of four and, uh, and, and a couple other staffers who moved in and out between the Washington and Charleston offices. And eventually I became his district director. And just when I thought, well, I, I can't really do much more here. This has been a great you know, six, seven years of, of my life. Now I'm going to go to law school. So I applied to law school, got accepted at Catholic University. And he helped me, by the way. He, had, he knew, had a friend that was a professor there. Personally, you know, met with me, told me what the process was like. But about that time, same time as I had been accepted, in early uh, July, I learned that he had decided he was going to run for governor in two years. And I had one of these, what do I do? This is an unbelievable opportunity. And he came to me and he said, I'm telling you this because you're going to, I'm just now coming to the conclusion, I think I'm going to do this, but I don't want to talk you out of going to law school because my mentor um, would roll over in his grave if he thought I was trying to talk someone out of going to law school who's been accepted. Um, but nonetheless, I ultimately decided that that's what I was going to do, was I was going to, I was going to put it off. And I, frankly, I thought that's probably it. Uh, probably, this will probably be, you know, law school would have been great, but I have this great opportunity. So I was the, the um, moved to Charleston, left the, the congressional office, went full time on the governor's uh, gubernatorial staff, and was initially organizing in southern West Virginia, which was fun, uh, as well as the eastern panhandle and, and some other areas that I knew in north central West Virginia. But we, were, we ran into some fundraising problems, and I actually took the job with the campaign under one condition is that as I would not have to be part of the fundraising operation other than sporadically. And of course things change in, a con in campaigns and I ultimately became the finance director. So, so I, I really did nothing but fundraising the last four or five months. Uh, I hear Chuck, you know how this goes. Yeah, the boss says he needs you to do it, he needs you to do it. That's called a battlefield promotion. It, it, it absolutely <laughs> is. And considering the boss didn't like to fundraise either, you can imagine we had a lot of fun not having fun with each other. Um, but ultimately, he did win the race. It was a very close election. It was the 2000 election by three points. He, we defeated a, a very good man uh, who was an incumbent, Republican Cecil Underwood. We were, we were the only incumbent that, or I, he was the only incumbent that actually got defeated. Actually, the only challenger that won. And I went into the office. I also did a transition at the, the gubernatorial level. I worked for the executive director of the transition, who became our first chief of staff as his special assistant. So I was in the middle of all of the appointments and all of the legal issues and trying to figure out how we were going to uh, pay for uh, our first month's salary. The, the, the budget wasn't looking very good for the governor's office. And then we went into office, and I became the, I was made one of the seven members of the, the Governor Wise's senior staff, and I was the director of federal policy and intergovernmental affairs, which is a long way of saying, like, I dealt with Washington, D.C. Uh, we did not have a, a, a office in Washington like many states do. 
but the interaction between state government and the federal government is, I think, much bigger and broader than people realize. So uh, I was the, essentially I was the staff person that dealt with the senators, with the congressional delegation, Democrats and Republicans. Shelley Caput had taken over uh, Governor Wise's seat, and I was the person. I was the first contact for all of them with the state, and vice versa. And that also included the the, the, the Bush White House, all the federal departments. Um, it included other governors uh, the, and the organizations like the National Governors Association, which is a really, really active organization. Uh, they're more involved than, than people realize. So I did all of that really interesting work. And then I also, once again, sort of uh, with the good comes the bad, uh, I also, as being sort of one of the political people that had been on the campaign, I got put in charge of all of the executive appointments um, for boards and commissions. So those boards that you were hearing, I know, I, I know, familiar with all those obscure boards. Um, I will tell you the Barbers and Cosmetology Board is one of the most political appointments there, there absolutely is. Um, but I worked very closely with our general counsel because many of them required Senate confirmation, not all of them. They all had certain, you know, we had requirements we'd have to meet. So I, I, I actually, myself and Jennifer Baldwin who worked with me, we went through code all the time. And I went to our general counsel and chatted with him all the time. He always went with me to the Senate hearings. and. Um, so that was, those were my, that's sort of the two things I did. And the other sort of thing I did, which was an interesting part of my job, and, uh, was being the federal person, I was also the liaison with folks like FEMA and did a lot of work with our state emergency services office. And after 9-11, all of a sudden, Homeland Security became a real, real thing. And so I served on, on the state terrorism management team, um, which was interesting in of itself. But long and short of it is, Finally decided I was going to go to law school. Governor Wise was going to be finished being governor. So I left a few months early and decided that I, was, I was going to go here in Morgantown. And I, I literally, um, three weeks prior, I was at the National Governors Association meeting in Seattle. Ten days after that, I was at the Democratic National Convention in Boston. Ten days after that, I was walking through the mountain wear, um, drinking coffee, wearing shorts and a baseball cap. And just thinking, like, how my life has changed suddenly from this nonstop 60, 70 hour a week job to law school, which I certainly believed was going to be very hard. Um, but I will say that I learned one thing about law school was it was, a, to me, it was a great advantage that I had been out and worked as long as I had. I had, I had some, some, certainly some downfalls, like most of the younger kids were all smarter than me. Um, but I had, had that, that real world experience that really helped. Um, so I, I, I absolutely actually loved law school most of the time, didn't love finals, but did fairly well, finished around the top third somewhere in, in my class, did moot court, loved it, absolutely loved it, um, did some of the trial competitions here, really, really enjoyed that. First summer I wore, went back to Martinsburg, went networking, I worked for a guy named Kim Martin at Martin and Seibert, who ran that, uh, that, that firm, and I got a really good experience uh, uh, working there in the summer learning about insurance law, learning about all kinds of things I wasn't necessarily interested in, but really gave me a good background uh, in, in, in the law. Next summer, I had a great opportunity, was one of two WVU students selected to, to clerk for the U.S. Attorney in Charleston. And that's actually where I, I did. I got to direct witnesses and hearings and in a trial. Um, I got to do all kinds of really interesting things. So, here are some sad things, worked directly with assisting U.S. attorneys and federal agents, and I loved that. And uh, it was my intention uh, after that, at, the, at their urging, that I apply to the honors program at the Department of Justice, which is really the only way to get a job with the Justice Department after law school. And uh, everything looked good, um, went through the background checks again, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden I didn't get it. It was one of those, oh, well, that didn't happen. Um, Funny, funny story is, is that later in the summer after I had accepted a job already, uh, had just finished taking the bar, they, the ATF called me and asked me was I still interested in a position. And I always wondered, like, how, I don't, couldn't figure out why that occurred. Later turned out there, there was a young staffer at the Department of Justice who on her own went through and took all of the people of a certain political party and eliminated them from consideration. It's a true story. It became a, a class action lawsuit. And I was always pretty sure that I was one of the 600 people that that uh, happened to, which is why they then called and said, would you like to come work for us? Um, but, but you know what? That was all right because I, I ended up in a good place. So what happened is I started applying everywhere. 
uh, I knew that wanting to, and I wanted to go back to Washington. I knew it was going to be very difficult um, because we know WVU is great, but WVU is in Georgetown. It's not George Washington or Harvard, which is where you know that with most of the lawyers in Washington, many well, many of them start out there, and that's what the big lawyers know. And you know they don't know all of the great things about WVU. Um, so I was really working it hard. I was using contacts, but in the end, I'll tell you how I got my first law job is because of a guy right here at WVU Law School named Andy Wright. Andy Wright um, was uh, married to Caprice Roberts, who was uh, a, co a law school professor here. Um, opposite, she, was, she taught opposite Professor Cardi contracts. I had her for remedy, remedies. And um, Andy was her husband and moved with her. That He had been a, a, a political guy in Washington. And he taught two classes on his own. He worked at Jackson Kelly. And uh, the long and the short of it is, I, I told Andy I really wanted to go to Washington. And he set me up with multiple people to meet with just to talk about a job. And one of them was a guy named Pete Hoffman, who Andy worked with at Jackson Kelly. He, was, he split time between Martinsburg and Washington. I went in, he said, I'll try and help you. He gave me all these names in the white collar world. And the next thing I knew, a, Two weeks later, he called and said, hey, actually, I, I would like to hire you. And so I worked at Jackson Kelly for two and a half years. And, and then as things go, one of the partners left. Pete was close to retiring. And uh, I got a chance to go back and work for my old boss again, who ran a nonprofit organization. Um, so now I work for Governor Wise again. I'm his lawyer and, his, and a senior advisor. It's the Alliance for Excellent Education. We focus on education. We're a nonprofit. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little about what I do maybe during the question and answer. I don't want to monopolize the, the time, but um, I will just get back to say that networking is incredibly important and I uh, would love to talk more about <coughs> sort of what I do now. It's just very interesting. So. Thank you. So I'm feeling li a little bit like I'm batting for the other team because I don't know any politicians and I've never worked in the government, but nonetheless, I hope I can uh, offer some valuable advice. So I just graduated last year, so I don't have a lot of background, so I'm gonna spend the majority of my time probably giving you what I hope is helpful advice in how to actually um, break into the private practice since I don't have any government experience. I've spent the last year seeing how at least a big law firm hires and kind of come up with some ideas on how students from a regional school like West Virginia particularly can break into that market um, and kind of get around their hiring practices. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of my background first. I'm not originally from West Virginia. I graduated from George Mason University in Northern Virginia, uh, and I graduated high school there too, so that's where I'm originally from. I was a paralegal all the while I was working in college, so I did both simultaneously, knowing that I always wanted to go to law school, but I was a first generation law student or a graduate, so I didn't really have the finances to go to law school at the time. So I worked in DC as a paralegal right after I graduated for two years. Um, so a total about six years paralegal experience. Finally pulled the trigger and came to WVU Law School in 2013. And then all the while I was in school, I knew I wanted to get back into the DC area because I, I just, I'm a city girl and I love the city and I loved the big law experience. So I kind of wanted to break into that. And it was, I found it really challenging because at least the big law firms, they, they hire through OCI just like West Virginia does. So they go primarily to the big schools in that area and only take resumes from those students. And while you can submit your resume through their online process, it's, nobody's ever gonna look at it and it's kind of just falling on deaf ears. So the way I got in is I ended up applying, when I was a paralegal for Troutman Sanders before I left for law school, I stayed you know, in close contact with an attorney there and the HR person, and I tried to leave on really good terms and letting them know that I was interested in coming back and trying to keep that network open. So even though the Tyson's Corner office, which is uh, um, Northern Virginia, it's kind of outside of DC a little bit, that was the office I worked in. I, even though they weren't hiring a summer associate, I kept, you know, pestering them almost and sending them my resume and saying, please, please, if you have any positions for summer associate, take me. They didn't have anything for my first year, and so I ended up clerking for Judge Keeley, which was an awesome experience if you do get that opportunity. Uh, but I finally broke in my second summer, and I was able to be a summer associate there. And while I 
hoped to break into the litigation aspect, they didn't have a position open for an associate. And so I spent the whole time trying to you know, schmooze the finance folks and tell, convince them that they needed an associate for when I graduated. Finally did that and they actually offered me a position for when I graduated. So I am now in transactional law. I, it's commercial finance, so I represent a lot of lenders uh, that loan money to a lot of startup tech companies. So that's my background, that's where I'm at now. I just started my second year as an associate there. And um, to give you kind of a day-to-day -day summary, I am really busy. It, I also have two kids, so uh, work-life balance does not exist in my, my world yet, but I'm hoping to be there eventually. Uh, I, I spend, you know, I'm in transactional, so I do a lot of uh, contract drafting and loan drafting and due diligence review of, you know, uh, startup companies and their organizational documents to make sure my clients, which are lenders, that when they're, you know, lending money to a company that has no assets and no revenue that, you know, the bank's going to get repaid. So uh, I use my CARDI classes, my contracts class, and my UCC secure transactions every day and wish I would have paid more attention. But uh, hopefully I'm doing him proud. Uh, okay, so anyway, really busy. It's tough. First year is tough if you go into big law, but hang in there because it gets so much better and it's really rewarding and you may feel like you're drowning, but you will learn a whole bunch in that first year as, you know, a way, I hope, I'm telling myself this, that I learned way more in big law being so busy than I would have in a smaller firm, but let's, let's hope that's actually true. So what can you do now? To, uh, you know, to break in. And one of the most, imp what I hope is gonna be beneficial is there, a lot of law firms now are implementing a staff attorney program. So they hire, the, the difference, nobody really knows and it differs by law firm, but there's an associate, which I think they hire with the goal of making partner one day. So they invest a lot more in your training and you get a higher salary and your name's on the website and fancy things. But they also have a staff attorney program, and they're usually paid less, but they have lower billable hour requirements, and they don't recruit for staff attorneys necessarily on campus. They're, and they're not always like the same hiring season. They post advertisements on their websites or through recruiters for uh, these positions. So you can get in th your, your foot in the door that way. And I think the most beneficial thing with that is, or most helpful thing is networking. Uh, like finding people that you know in the area and sending them your resume, looking out for job postings for staff attorneys, because a lot of law firms have program, you know, their staff attorney program is such that if you work really hard for two years, you can be promoted to associate. So I think that's helpful. Another really helpful thing would be local clerkships, not necessarily at the federal level, but you know, judges it, in local clerks' offices hire clerks too. And although there's a lot of Virginia law grads, they. Uh, they don't necessarily hire from Virginia schools. So coming from West Virginia, you should be able to get in the door that way, particularly if you know somebody. And then you can use that as a springboard to any other <coughs> area. Another thing is look for local bars, the local county bar programs. A lot of times they have job blasts. And if you get on their mailing list, you get an email with all their opening job positions that way. And you can apply. They're not necessarily first year so associate positions, but you know, lower level too, so you can get in that way. And don't shoot for big law. Like, <clears throat> don't get discouraged if right away you're not accepted at a big law firm because it's really difficult to get in that way if you don't graduate from a school that they recruit on and if your parent's not a lawyer at a big law firm. So don't get discouraged, but look, shoot for a local law firm because your first job isn't necessarily going to be your last job. But if you work really hard, like everybody has said, and show that you are smart, even though you know West Virginia doesn't always have the best reputation because we're not Georgetown. But you know, if you work really hard and show that you're just as capable as any other law student, you know that show they'll keep that in mind, and they know you know people in that area know other people in that area, and if you prove that you are valuable and smart, you can go far. Um, so I want to leave you with that: that you don't get discouraged, especially even if you don't get a job in DC right after you graduate, there's opportunities. There's a lot of internship programs for the government. There's a lot of um, not necessarily paid work, but it's your foot in the door. And 
networking is really important. So if you just show somebody that you're worthwhile, they'll spread that around and you will get paid eventually. <laughs> I just hope it didn't start because it's really expensive to live there. So <laughs> anyway, uh, ask me any questions. I'm here. I love to help people. So I can be your network. <laughs> well, that, that brings me to a good point. So um, I was taking notes. I didn't notice anyone else with pens. So don't worry about it. I got it. <laughs> So what we heard over and over again um, is that you have to be ready to, to, to reinvent yourself and to change with the times, that it's important to have a backup plan, that it's important to be really intentional when you're selecting, even, even at the law school level, like Chris was saying, um, he, he's really honed in on labor and, labor and employment law courses and was able to get some opportunities just by being so intentional with his coursework. Once you get there, it's intentional um, planning with each new job you take that it's bringing you towards what that goal is. So we heard that over and over again. Um, a lot of these individuals capitalized on West Virginia connections. So we heard politics a lot, so poli political connections, um, and, and starting with your West Virginia delegation, networking. Um, so today is a great day to start your DC networking, right? We have five individuals who are more than happy to help you. But I do want to warn you that networking isn't just two or three years from now when you're ready to get a job in West Virginia sending an email to Mr. Britt and saying, hey, I was at that thing three years ago. You've never heard from me since, but will you please tell somebody to hire me because he's not going to do that for you. Networking is a two-way street and you really need to keep in touch. So my one networking tip for you today, because I want to have lots of time for your questions, um, what I would start doing at this point is making a list of all your professional contacts. And once a semester, you want to send an email to all of them to update them on your progress. I always did that when grades came out. I would send an email to all of my professional contacts. I'd put a little bit of personalized in it, but just generally, hey, things are going well. Um, I read an article that I, made me think of you and your presentation you did, those kinds of things. You really want to keep that, you, you want to have a relationship, not just a name drop, okay? Um, if, if you guys want any more tips on that, if you want me to read your emails or suggest how to craft them, that's what I'm there for. I'm here all the time, so stop in anytime. Um, I want to um, give you guys time to ask your questions. So we have a, a microphone set up for you. Um, you can ask any of these individual questions. You can pitch in questions to all of them and kind of get multiple feedbacks. So whoever wants to get us started, just go ahead and <coughs> step up to the, the microphone. Yeah, and I'll, if I can, I'll say a couple of things while you get up to the mic. Because, you know, at my senior status, you know, it's about career development. I think one important thing is to know yourself understand what motivates you, what's make, what makes you happy, what you think you want to do with this career, because you can do a lot of things with it. Um, you know, they say uh, people are good at what they enjoy, people enjoy what they're good at. So I just encourage you to try to make this career a tool for you and don't be victim to it. And, and you'll have to find different manifestations of the practice and the law, and you and the more you see and do, the more you'll say, boy, I really enjoy doing that, I don't like. It. For me, litigation seemed like a big game. I wanted to build something, not tear it apart. So, but I, I wouldn't have known that. I mean, everyone gets channeled into litigation, and, it's, and everyone in West Virginia is a litigator, and so it just sometimes, um, and as far as Washington, as I think about Washington, I came, it was, to me, as I came to Washington, um, I was already five years in practice, too late to go to the Hill. I was 31. I felt like, oh, I missed that. It would have been so nice to channel and try to manage a career path through Washington that says, I like environmental law, so I'll go to the committee. I'll try to then move down to EPA. And then, again, the law firms are revolving doors. They understand it. You come in, you come out. And so, to me, if I could have picked a subject matter of law and then tried to work through the institution of Washington, I would have been trying to do regulatory, legislative, uh, department, agency, independent agency, lobby shop, law firm. So that's how Washington works. And I think what you've heard directly, it's a relationship place. And that means it's very fluid and that can be good and that can throw you too. So I think you have to decide, you know, what 
what you like about the law, what appeals to you, and then try to find the manifestation of it that works. Um, and like many things in life, you got to do several different things before you begin to like sort through what works for you and what you enjoy doing. Because if you enjoy it, you'll be good at it. If you're good at it, people like you doing it, and, and it'll be helpful. That's really the way the world works more so than it is whether it's a, uh, not the name of the, whether it's on your law degree. You, you, just, you just rise above that. It doesn't matter, really. As long as you're a good student, you're well-intentioned, you're honest, you work hard, you'll do just fine. The other thing I would say is the approaches is you learn by doing. No, go ahead, come up. You, you learn by doing. I mean, so much. I'm now really a robust software lawyer. <laughs> Where did I learn that? And a software lawyer, now I've evolved it right into cyber. And um, you learn by doing. And, and, and when, when I decided to pursue technology, because I didn't really have a career path, I was back in the private sector, and I talked myself into a law firm doing legislative stuff, and I knew that all those relationships are going to atrophy every election. If you're, if you're subject to the, if your strength is based on who you know in Washington, that's going to change all the time. So I said, I got to find, I got to find a place for me. And so I was in Washington when the dot com happened and I said, this is what I want to do. And through relationships was getting referrals of young software companies that were going through VC rounds. And I started taking them through VC rounds just based on having a good rap and someone's, I don't know what he knows about the internet, but he's a very entrepreneurial lawyer. And so many ways that's the way it is and whether both at the dot com time and now the cyber, I read everything all the time. And you know, that wonderful computer in your head, if you get an area that you like and it interests you, you just pour data, information, intelligence through it, your brain will sort it out. All these various data security areas, it'll just start putting them in boxes and you start tracking that issue through HIPAA, through FTC, through SEC, through DOD, through D. So that's the thing is like knowing yourself and knowing what a great resource you have with who you are and what you're learning at this institution. The name doesn't matter. It's the fact that you're in the law, which is just a wonderful, wonderful uh, tool for you. For me, I found I got to figure out how to make, how to make it work. It's, it, it'll tend to channel you and you'll think, well, I got to have this one certain manifestation of the law. It's, that's not the case at all. It'll serve you no matter what you do, business or legal. Oh, thank you. I'm Julian Pecora from Clarksburg, West Virginia. I'm a 1L here. And my question could be answered by all of you is that we keep on hearing about networking, networking, and networking. But what are some of the best ways for us being three hours away from DC to build these long lasting professional relationships where it's to the point where not that I just know somebody, but to the point where that person can actually get you a job or put, get you in contact with the right person? That's a great question. I'm sure everyone's got some thoughts on that. But yeah, it, it isn't, and I, I try to lose. It's nice to know someone, but it, you, you do need more than just knowing people. Um, obviously, you've, you know, how you're doing in law school is going to help you as you, you do the job market. But you know, ways to build relationships in Washington, D.C., for example, if you don't already have them. Um, she, gave, I thought she gave some great suggestions about the staff attorney positions. But once again, she, she mentioned it helps to know some people that are involved in that. So how do you do that? Um, my advice would be, number one, is start right here at this law school with the professors. Um, your, talk to your professors. And I mentioned Andy Wright, who, I, who taught me two classes. And ultimately, that is how I got my job. But you know, Vince Carty helped me. Lots of people helped me. And I talked to them, told them what I was interested in. And so people would point me in directions. Um, but, you know, if you can do an internship, even if you don't get paid for it, there is value to it. Um, you may also look at externships. So I know the law school does that uh, in some ways. In fact, I've talked to me before about trying to do one at, at, at my organization. Would lo love to do that at somewhere. You don't get paid, but you get credit. And you learn what it's really like to be a lawyer. And the other thing is, is you, you may be focused on a firm or you may be focused on government, but the one great thing about D.C. is it's so broad. There's so many different things. So there's the firms, there are the, the, the government jobs, and, and you know, like the we're National Labor Relations Board. I do tons of work with the FCC, believe it or not. I file things. Lots of people, that's all they do is work at the FCC. Um, and then there's all these organizations and the in-house councils. And there's so many different opportunities in Washington that, you know, sort of keep your eyes open. It may not be a traditional law firm job at first 
that gets you your foot in the door. Um, and nonprofits, which, you know, I do, I do contract work, I do trademark uh, law now, I, I, as I mentioned, I do, I file things with the Federal Communications Commission, and I've become an expert, actually, around technology on data, data and privacy. I, I need to talk with the fellows at the end of the table about that. That's become a big deal. And so it's the whole reinventing yourself, uh, and always, what's, what's a skill I have I can build on? I do want to, um, Alan is another uh, big law associate who is someone that I spoke to initially in the beginning, and I just want to echo Chip some sentiment that it, it's not like you can just make up people out of nowhere and be like, oh, hi, are you, can you be my network? Like, let's be a network. That's not, it, it doesn't really work like that. So one of the things that I did is I sat down with uh, Dean Bergnoli when she was at the time the uh, Dean of Career Services, and I asked her, I told her, I really want to get into DC, can you help me? And at the time, Alan Wil Wilson, had been hired as an associate of Will Mahale. So he and I sat down and he told me one of the tricks that he used was Lexus, Lexus Nexus, I think, has a program where you can type up, a t look for attorneys or something in a particular law firm and search somehow by West Virginia University. And you can see who graduated from the College of Law that works at that law firm. So if you're, pr one of the things he did was he just started contacting alumni at that law firm and say, hey, I'm really interested in getting there. Here's my credentials. And if you've seen Alan Wilson's credentials, it's no wonder he got hired in DC. So he, you know, he started reaching out to them that way because if you can find someone, anyone in the door of the law firm, they can scoot your resume in front of the people who make hiring decisions. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a partner because at least in my office, like an associate that's one year higher than me does the on-campus recruiting. So you know, you could be anybody, your neighbor's babysitter or something. If they work at the law firm, they can scoot your resume in front of them. But you have to, you know, they're not just going to do it for anybody. You have to have good credentials and be polite and, you know, ha they have to think highly of you. But that's a good way of finding people. Go through the alumni network and just seek out those people at the law firms and, you know, politely contact them to get your, see if they can help you out that way. And also undergrads, they may, there are WU undergrads who, may not have got their law degree right. here, but they, they also can help you. Just mm -hmm. another, the, the uh, healthcare lead attorney for Mintz Levin is Karen Lovitch, who went to WVU undergrad American Law School. I send people to her all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Chelsea was mentioning Alan Wilson. He was supposed to be one of our um, speakers today. He had an emergency transactional matter come up from one of their largest clients, so he apologized that he couldn't be here for this panel discussion. I am going to provide you with his contact information so that you have access to him. He's very open to helping you, just like he did um, mm -hmm. with Chelsea. Um, and then also Chelsea is referencing a particular resource that will send you the instructions on how to use so that you have that. I've got a list of everybody who attended today, so we'll send you notes on how to use that resource, all right? Um, so on the Capitol Hill end, um, when I worked for the last congressman, I, was, I would do hiring for his office since I ran his DC operation. Um, I would always be happy to do uh, informational interviews with anybody who would contact me looking for a job. I, I know exactly how hard it was to get your foot in the door. So I was always happy to meet with people. And if I didn't know of a position that was open, maybe you know I could keep their resume. And, and you know if they kept in contact with me and were proactive, I would remember them and try to put them in for other positions that I would hear about. A lot of the positions aren't on Capitol Hill aren't advertised. They're all done word of mouth. Uh, I think some of us have alluded to that. And uh, it's important to network. But being proactive, um, reaching out to folks that, again, in the West Virginia delegation, meeting with the chief of staff in that office um, or the legislative director, that they're a wealth of information. You know, they have their own network that they've established. Um, also, um, so uh, the executive MBA program for WVU has a cohort in DC, and they come up and talk about the intersection of government and politics and, and policy twice a year. I speak on that panel, and I've met so many of their there are students that have come up to me afterwards and said, hey, I'm really interested um, in trying to find a position in DC, whether it be on the Hill or in government relations or even at a law firm. Do you know of anybody? Do you know of other WVU alumni, not just from the law school, but again, from the undergraduate, uh, you know, uh, who have undergraduate degrees? And, and I'll connect them from all the folks that I've met over the years. And it's, it's really a, a good network to have. I mean, people from West Virginia, it's a small state, but they're very loyal. And I think, you know, they'd always be happy to help. So be proactive and reach out to folks and good things will happen. 
Yeah, and I think it's probably like uh, I was thinking as the, he asked the question, you know, it's really like events, like <clears throat> networking has to be your relationship. People are investing in you and you're investing in them. So I would drive over from Pittsburgh at that time trying to figure out Washington and I would, I would go to events. I would say, okay, congressional hearing and maybe there's a relevant trade association. And so I would try to get in meetings or organizations or speeches or something to trade or the Chamber of Commerce event. And again, rubbing shoulder to shoulder, experiencing a common, a common speech or a common event or a panel hearing and you'll sit there and you'll talk to the, whoever's beside you. And so it really is you developing relationships of people and out of you discussing your areas of interest, people will, they, I was always amazed in Washington, people will really try to help you. I mean, they, they don't really know you and you just, they, people wanna help people. It's a, it's a great city in that sense, but you have to get up and go and rub shoulder to shoulder and experience events together and go to events and try to find your community of interest and, um, and it'll kind of open up to you. I, uh, Syracuse University used to do, and I don't know if they still do, like two weeks, they would bring their MBA students down to Washington for two weeks and a friend of mine back in my political days was the staff director for the Senate Banking Committee Don, back when Don Regal was, was chairman. And so he would put together for this uh, two weeks of MBA students he would put all of us, what I'd call has -beens. I always kind of held the chair of the former general counsel of a cabinet agency. And so he would have a staff, somebody from the committee and someone from all these different, from the regulatory agency. And so he was trying to show these students how Washington works. And, um, and I, my advice was always, and it was always fun talking about how cabinet agencies work and, and what, a, what a lawyer's role is in a cabinet agency. And, and all that stuff, and it was, it was great fun. But, you know, one of my advice was always, if you're in town for the summer or for any time, don't let a presidential race go, do, go through this town without you participating in it. It doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what party, it doesn't matter if you're folding letters, or don't let a presidential race go through in this town and you not be there as once a week, twice a week, because those relationships of the copy boy that you just played, you know, they end up, in a deputy assistant secretary in some agencies. So again, I think it just makes the point that Washington is relationships. You just have to create them. People can't give them, you just can't come take my relationships. I can try to help you, but it, you gotta go build them. And, what, and all people can really do for you is to give you kind of the targeting and intelligence to, to strategically for yourself, make it work for you. It, it'll work, you have to make it work, but that's life, really. That's why, I'm, as I th was thinking about this, is like I have so many thoughts and so much I've learned and mistakes I've made and stupid things I did and why did I do that? And fortunately, you know, somebody caught me before I fell off the ledge <laughs> and I just didn't know any better. And so that's the way life is, isn't it? And so, you know, if, if what you want out of law practice is to write wills and, and to be a community organizer and that's like, you know, the whole Washington thing is not for everyone. It's fluid. It's unpredictable, it's unreliable in some ways, but it's, it's for a lawyer, if you're, if you're trying to do something, you know, I used to say to myself, I wanna get out of the implementation of law and the commercial to the formation of law. Like I'm, now I'm over here in public policy and that's really what motivated, it took me a while to figure out that what I like about it is because I've just moved up the spectrum of my law career and so it's almost, the idealism of law school I found in Washington, but I didn't, I didn't know that going in. So I just, I just add a couple things. Like first, all this was very good, very, very good advice. Like uh, I think Chip said, use the professors here. A lot of them worked at agencies in D.C., came here from Washington D.C. Uh, or better, no prior students. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you better believe that. You know, I was pretty good buddies with Professor LaFossa when I was here. Um, no, I wanted to do labor law, but uh, so that's really important and they will reach out to you or reach out on your behalf, put you in contact with people like the job that I got right out of law school uh, just so happened that one of the commissioners at the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission was an attorney here in Morgantown and so Professor LaFasso and some of the professors knew him and you know they were hiring attorneys and because of Upper Big Branch and said, you know, hey, we got some great uh, students here that are interested in those issues. You know, here are a couple, uh, one of my other classmates from Southern West Virginia, they come from the coal fields. Like, they understand these issues, they're very passionate about it, they wanna go work on these things. And it kinda helped us get flagged and uh, given strong consider 
consideration. So definitely use the professors. Um, Gene mentioned the informational interviews. That's like a huge thing. Um, it's very huge on Capitol Hill. I mean, we kind of colloquially will call it getting coffee. Like, and I've done I don't know how many of them. And you have to. They're they're very helpful. And I think the original question was, you know, how do I how do I actually start a network? How do I do this? Do I just go to some cocktail party and try to talk to people? Like, it's a very intimidating process, especially when you're in a room with a bunch of people that are all schmoozers, and you're like, how do I how do I do this? And these informational interviews are really helpful. And a lot of times, like, you'll even meet, I think Gene said, you'll meet with somebody and they can't help you, but they know somebody that can help you. And there's this, like, snowball effect. And a lot of people in Washington, D.C. got jobs through that same process. So they're always willing to, like, pay it forward. Like, you think even these, like, super busy people that have these high-powered jobs, you know, you got to catch them when, you know, maybe Congress is in recess or something like that when they have more time to meet with you, but uh, they'll do it because somebody did it for them one day. So they're always, people are always willing to, to sort of help and, and do that. So don't hesitate to reach out to people because you really have nothing to lose by, uh, by asking. And then, you know, sometimes people just offer to, it's just a DC thing. Like sometimes people offer to, to be helpful to you even if you don't ask them. I mean, so Steve and I are on the visiting committee together and the first like meeting we had, I, it was when I was still a political appointee in the Obama administration, and that was coming to an end, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And he said, hey, I went through that process, and if you ever want to talk about it, let me know. I'll, I'll kind of tell you what I did, and, you know, it's a great experience, and, you know, here's kind of some things to think about. So even without me asking him, he just volunteered. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's just don't be afraid to, to reach out to people and to take one person and to kind of snowball it and, Kind of expand your network that way. Sure. Um, Rob Hickman, 1L here. Um, heard a lot about fluidity and networking. Um, what other major concerns would you throw out there, uh, especially me just starting out here, uh, that you would anticipate is we should look to? You know, any other obstacles, whether um, you know you found that uh, in whether you're public or private, or um, if you, uh, well, just what else would you anticipate if you were anticipating moving out there, basically, um, that we could prepare for even right now that uh, you, you pull from your own experience? I mean, talking about what it is that you really want to get into, uh, how do you find yourself if you're in a rut, how do you get out of it to, move around as need be. I'm, I'm pretty sure with DC being fluid as it is, but um, what, what other obstacles, I guess, basically, are you anticipating whether whatever area of law you're getting into that we haven't heard? Well, DC is just such a competitive market. I mean, so you really, I mean, you really just have to work your tail off, to be honest. I mean, apply to blind ads, apply to every legal job you think you might have be interested in. Um, I remember applying to, to jobs at the FCC now I work with some of the FCC, but in hindsight, I had no business applying for jobs at the FCC. I had no real background, but I thought maybe I did, so I tried. And so I think, I think I mean, from my perspective, it's just keep beating the drum. And uh, WVU gets, is getting a, a fair amount of respect now, I think, in the, in the Washington legal market. It used to be a little, it was tougher, though, uh, at one time, but you're still competing against the Harvards of the world because um, that's where they all want to go to. Um, so just, you know, staying at it. Uh, Chris mentioned something really, really good advice. Um, I also, I used to be on the visiting committee. The visiting committee, you should, when that group is here, you should, you should go out of your way to go out and try and meet some of those lawyers. Many of them are here in West Virginia. There's always a couple from D.C. or Pittsburgh. And they, that's a whole other group of folks, and they're committed to WVU Law School where they wouldn't be on it. So that's a whole other group of people, by the way, just in terms of meeting folks um, that, that you should do. But... Also, getting there and getting to the events, I think Steve mentioned that earlier, there are all kinds of events related to West Virginia and Washington, and many that aren't. Go to as many of both as you can. Um, but, you know, the West Virginia State Society is a networking organization in Washington. It's, it kind of went through a rough period. It's coming back now, I think. They have a couple of events a year. I serve on the board for it. WVU uh, Capital Chapter regularly has networking events. I was three weeks after passing the bar 
I decided I didn't want to go. I went to a networking lunch in Arlington one day. There were 10 people there. And I thought, I don't know if this is worth it, but sitting beside me uh, was a young woman, WVU graduate, who worked at a bank, and we're talking about what we do. And I said, oh, I'm part of a government, I do white collar work, I'm part of a government contracts group. She said, well, that's really interesting. You know, our bank focuses on government contracts, and they're, they're a bank here in West Virginia, but they're, out, they're all over the country. We represented them, but not in Northern Virginia. Three weeks later, I, I'm there with my, with three partners that are giving a pitch to the Northern Virginia branch, and we got work out of it. And it was kind of dumb luck, but I did, I, I, fortunately I showed up. So it's just, you just got to work really hard. I, I mean, that's, that's what it takes. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, there's this joke in D.C. that, like, everybody's a lawyer, and there's a lot of truth to it. Like, <laughs> law degrees are a dime a dozen in D.C., and people from, you know, the best law schools all over the country, that's where they go. Um, there's, you know, it's very, very competitive. Even outside of just the legal um, arena, it's just a competitive town. I mean, people are there, like, you know, people want to be the next senator, people want to be the next congressperson. It's a very competitive place, so you have to, you know, which was interesting for me when I went there because, you know, coming from, you know, small, rural, southern West Virginia, you know, being a lawyer was a big deal. Like, you were the big person in the, the community. Like, you were kind of the hot shot and, you know, the rich guy. And, you know, you, you made things happen. And then you go to a place like Washington, and you're like, oh, you got a law degree? Okay. Like, who doesn't? Yep. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. It's very competitive. So you have to be kind of – and coming from WVU and going out there, you have to be very, like, strategic, too. Um, you have to be dogged, and you have to be kind of strategic – and, you know, you, it's, it's kind of ties back into the networking stuff, too. So I was, you know, working for Senator Manchin, um, and I knew that I wanted to do labor things. And his, you know, he cared about labor issues. He cared about mine safety issues. But his bigger issues were, like, energy and some other things. And, you know, I knew that I should be reaching out to people that, did labor policy, because that's ultimately what I really wanted to do. So I made friends with the Labor Council of the Help Committee, and then, you know, I strategically, and he's now a colleague of mine at the National Labor Relations Board, and we're good friends, but I sought him out. I was like, I kind of want to know those people. So you have to be a little strategic in, in, you know, thinking about who you want to meet, and just so happen we had a mutual, like, friend from a previous job, and every job that I've had, I've kind of just continued to like meet people, network, and add to that. And it's weird, especially in the labor community in Washington, D.C. It's like everybody sort of knows one another. It's so, it's even though it's kind of a big place, it's, it's a small community. And, you know, you just got to be strategic. The only other thing I would throw out real quick is for those of you that are, since I'm here representing sort of the government attorney position, is, is there's going to be a ton of opportunities in the government in D.C. in the next. I don't know, five to ten years, because there's a lot of people retiring, and there are going to be a lot of job openings. So that's something to sort of think about and keep in mind, too. You know, like if, um, if we were having a conversation about this, my first question would be about you. That is, for me to help, to me to take what I know and can do, so I'd want to know why you came to law school, what is it about it you think you want to do, what's attractive you. So I would, I would turn the discussion and try to pull out of you and make you think about why did I come? You know, what am I trying to achieve? What attracts me about the law? And as I look at the different ways that I know of how it is implemented, practiced, and exercised, you know, and so, and I think that's a, that's a way for you to approach any of this is like, if you said to me, I'm interested in this or this possible or public interest law or something, you know, that would take me, then I'd have thoughts for you, and, I, and it would be the same for anyone, I think, of just, you know, let's climb into you what, what you, what you think you see and know and what you think you want to do and what motivates you and what you as a person and your upbringing. So, and I think that is kind of reflective of, you know, it's, it's important for you to make of it what it's, it's, it's an opportunity and a credential and, a, and an education and it's, from there, it's what you do with it. And, and I'd be willing to have a conversation with any of you about what you think you want to do with it. You know, I am so, and for the last many years, like, you know, I just, I am always over the horizon on technology. I watch how it's happening. I see how it's happening. I know what it means. I, from a lawyer's standpoint, the convergence of what's happening from a legal regulatory, 
is the most unbelievable. It is so incredibly complex. And so back in the internet days, you know, when I thought about the internet, I want to do technology. Here I was like 41. I was kind of bouncing around a law firm trying to, trying to lobby. And it was like, you could see when the internet happened that, that it's huge, it's disruptive, it's not going to change, it's never going back, and, um, and it's going to change the world. And the neat thing from a lawyer standpoint is that the, legal, the legality around the internet was to be created. I, I, I thought to myself, after nine years of senior political work, I didn't catch this because no one knows any more than I. It's only been around two or three years. And, and I say to my friends around data security and privacy and cyber and whatever you want to use for it, this is the old internet days. It's going to change the world. It's not coming back. IoT is going to make it even more complex. I'm doing a bunch of data hosting deals. I'm working with major data centers. Like you can see, you can see. So to me, that makes it very exciting. And and it is so complex legally that I'm like, this is where I'd want to be because there'll always be a need for it, and it's changing every moment. And you know, now with the Equifax breach, it's like you know, maybe we're maybe we're about to cross the hurdle on a national data breach statute. The states are already so far ahead. They'll they'll add a federal layer on it. They won't they they won't get it preempted um, unless they go all the way to California, Massachusetts standards, which is possible. And then here comes GDPR and the European Union right to be first. So it is it is just so. I look at the world and as I went career management wise, you know, like what am I going to do? I'm like a policy lawyer. What what interests me? And, it, and just had to make it, you know, just had to make it up in many ways, just trade on those relationships and start picking up young internet companies, taking them through VC rounds. I've never done a VC round, um, but like anything, you learn by doing. So I, I, fig I had a very same experience, uh, similar experience where I figured out uh, when I started handling tech policy work that this is really what I wanted to do. It's innovative, um, you know, it's, it's the future of the economy, it changes all the time. Steve was mentioning the internet. One of the things I work on right now is uh, vehicle technology and autonomous vehicles. We have a number of chips that go into self-driving cars. So many issues regarding uh, regulatory and um, uh, 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 policy issues that are out there like uh, cybersecurity, privacy of data, uh, liability if a car crashes. All these things are out there. The technology is almost further along than the policy. So lawmakers are really scrambling to catch up. So it's it's a really disruptive technology that's really interesting and so many things. And I've realized that that's kind of what I wanted to do and I built my, my career kind of towards that goal. Um, I want to also agree with what Chip said. Um, my boss always says 95% of life is showing up. So just being there, going to these opportunities uh, where you can network and meet people, I think that's super important, just being able to be proactive and, and go out and talk to people. Uh, tell them your story, where you are in your career and what you're looking for. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think that's all very important. So, and, and you mentioned what are some of the problems you might encounter, uh, a lot because of their, these jobs are so competitive, you know, um, the timing, even if you put yourself in the right position, the timing might not be right, or, you know, something in your career might not be right, the, you know, it might not be the right time for this position. Just be patient and, you know, I understand there's constraints to that, but, you know, things will happen if, you, if you're doing the right things. Quickly, I do want to say one of the obstacles that I ran into was um, coming from out of state with law school. They, a lot of people that you're hiring with aren't convinced that you actually want to be there or that you're not going to leave and go somewhere else or that if we offer you a position, you're not actually going to accept it once you graduate. So be prepared to convince people that you do want to be in D.C. and have, you know, find some connection. Oh, you know, my family's from here or my, you know, I visited one time when I was a kid and I just loved it and I just want to be here. Like, come up with a reason to explain to people why you want to be in D.C. and convincingly do so. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, for any of you that are interested in the D.C. market and, and you're anticipating that as an obstacle, please come see us. We have a whole host of suggestions for how you can, um, you know, present yourself as somebody who has a serious um, interest in that area. And we have a, a whole series of tips for you on how to market yourself as somebody with a, a serious interest. Um, I love all these questions. And I want us to continue to, to ask questions of our gracious panelists who've all agreed to stay um, for our reception. 
but our event planner, Margaret O. Bush, has done an amazing job of putting together a really nice reception. So I was hoping that we could all go out and enjoy some of this delicious food and wine and continue to ask our questions. And if anything comes up and you're talking with any of our panelists and it causes you to think of things that you want to tell me, I'll be here the whole time too, as will Roz. So I'd like to thank our panelists so much. This was a an incredible donation of their time. And they've and been an amazing audience. I can't, um, I can't imagine how patient and, <laughs> and attentive. And this lady right here who's got the greatest head, your face, like you, you, you agreed with everything all of us said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I know that was so much of your time to come out here today. So thank you very much. You. If you see Margaret Obush, be sure to thank her. It's just fabulous out there.